So let's start again. Mm. So, okay, we are ready. And I'm very glad to welcome um, all of you uh, today for uh, this uh, second uh, opportunity to listen to uh, Thanasis Ioriakopoulos. Um, I won't uh, introduce him uh, like I did last week, just to, to remind everyone that uh, Athanasios Yeriakopoulos uh, is a linguist uh, from the University of Thessaloniki in Greece, and he is our guest this month of uh, June until 12 July uh, here at Latis, uh, which is uh, which is our lab in uh, Montrouge. We are actually elsewhere here, Rue des Irlandais. Um, and he is the guest also of uh, ch in international chair of LABEX UFL. And so, as some of you may know, uh, LABEX UFL uh, invite international guests of um, uh, who um, provide important contribution to the field. Um, and, um, and they selected Thanasis to come and give us four sessions. So some of you may have seen last week's session, which was an introduction to the issue, the question of semantic maps and semantic networks, collectification networks. Maybe Thanasus will remind us a little bit of what he explained uh, last week. Uh, and then he we, he's going to uh, go ahead today. Um, and so I'm going to give him the floor and you can share your screen. Thank you, Anna. Okay. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Okay, try to scroll. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me? That's not the right screen thing. Is it? You want to share your PowerPoint? Um, I think I. Yeah, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And then, and then just. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Now. So you think the one we see is this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Which you maybe I will change it to a presentation mode. Yeah, just can, a can, you, can you do that? Um, you know how to do it? Yep. All right. Okay, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Can you keep uh, can people understand hear us now? Okay, they don't have to. Yes. My mic is all right. Yes. Speak, speak, speak. My mic okay, is all right. It seems to be fine. Um, okay, so okay, so they do hear me, right? Yes. Oh, uh, okay, so let's start. Okay, thank you once again for the kind introduction. So that's uh, the first part of the four uh, part uh, seminar I would like to give on representing lexical polysemy from semantic maps to language specific networks. So last time we focused on uh, uh, the overview of semantic maps. So we saw uh, how, how, what are the, the basic uh, methodological um, notations, uh, what are the advantages, the disadvantages. We also compared semantic maps to uh, polysemy networks and collectification networks, all sorts of networks. Uh, today, I would like us to move from theory to practice and um, that's my title, semantic maps from theory to practice. Uh, this will be the outline of the talk. I will start with uh, some uh, basic notions that I would like us to have in mind when discussing today's issues. Uh, for example, what do we mean by classification? Uh, how one uh, proceed in constructing the map? Just the, the very basic steps. And then uh, the basic goal of today's talk is to show you how one can construct a semantic map automatically, actually, but also um, manually. Uh, so the, this issue of inferring semantic maps uh, from cross-linguistic data. Um, and so this uh, automatic plotting of semantic maps, uh, uh, which will be uh, the, the, the real goal, uh, will be divided into two sections, uh, into non-weighted maps and uh, weighted maps. So uh, two types of maps I would like us to see today, uh, those that do not include 
uh, information about the frequency of attestation in the language of the world and those that include such uh, information. So that's uh, the basic distinction between known weighted maps and uh, or weighted maps. So previously, how to map maps, uh, what did we see the other time? Um, we introduced the notion of a graph. Uh, a graph consists of a set of uh, nodes and a set of edges. Uh, so you can see here this figure that we have these circles uh, representing nodes, and we are the nodes, and the connecting lines connecting uh, the two nodes uh, are called edges. And uh, the example that we used at the time was uh, uh, the uh, tree fire with fire uh, polysemy, and then uh, the tree here represents a node and the edge, uh, I mean, the same with uh, firewood, so a tree and the firewood, these are two nodes, and the edge connecting the two uh, is the one you see uh, here. Um, so let us remember what we mean by a collectification. Uh, a collectification, as, sorry, as introduced by uh, Alex, uh, let me hide this one here, yeah. Um, is defined as follows, a given language is said, lexify two functionally distinct senses, if and only if it can associate them with the same lexical form. So that's a, a, a different definition from what we normally see uh, in polysemy, uh, which is a phenomenon um, whereby a form is associated with two or more senses uh, which are related uh, in some way. So take the example from this from a paper uh, from Schaper and your colleagues. Uh, this was uh, from a language called uh, Duna, and we have the marker uh, Roa. Uh, and this marker can express the concept of tree, as you see in example A, uh, the concept firewood, as you see in example B, and the concept fire. Uh, as we see in uh, example C. So we say now that this form, uh, ROA, uh, collectifies uh, three uh, senses. And um, uh, we can uh, represent this as follows. You have, we have our three meanings, uh, the three firewood and uh, uh, fire, and uh, all these three senses are expressed via this lexeme role. Uh, now, if we check um, uh, the database clicks, which includes a collectification data from uh, our, uh, approximately 3,000 language varieties, we may see that uh, firewood and fire are collectified 68 times, and the red dots uh, um, um, represent this uh, collectification. And 29 qualifications we see for fire and tree, and uh, 62 for fire and tree. Now, um, these, these maps should be read together with the network because um, or you might be wondering what are the gray uh, dots. The gray dots are uh, all the other meanings that we see in the same, let's say, cluster uh, of meanings that a tree, firewood, and fire uh, appear. That's not important. The important thing is that we uh, do find these collectification patterns uh, in uh, many languages. Um, so now the question is, uh, can we graphically represent closed linguistic diversity? Okay. So uh, these maps here show closed linguistic diversity. And um, um, we see some maps that show where one can uh, see these collectification patterns. But um, and nothing to show the relation uh, between meanings. Uh, so that's the question: Can we graphically represent cross linguistic diversity? And then, is it possible to infer universal structure from cross linguistic data? Uh, so these are cross linguistic data that we saw before. And um, given this data, uh, are we able to infer universal structure? And this is actually the questions that uh, we try to answer uh, when using the semantic map uh, approach. 
So let's now take a hypothetical scenario, uh, the one that we saw the other day, but I, I made some adjustments. Um, so here we have four languages, uh, the language X, the language Y, Z, uh, X, uh, uh, with uh, stress here, and uh, different forms in different languages, right? The form and A, the form E and D, the form ka and lu, and the forms to uh, su and po. And uh, in um, uh, in the first language, the first uh, in the language uh, uh, X, uh, we saw where that one lexeme collectifies uh, all three uh, meanings. So again, I repeat this: uh, this is a, a hypothetical scenario, right, for the sake of illustration. And uh, now, in another language, the the marker do now collectifies two concepts, fire within fire, and this collectifies three. There is another marker for uh, expressing three. Uh, in another language, a marker K expresses three and firewood, so collectifies three and firewood, and there is another marker for expressing fire. And in the last language, we have three different lexical expressions, three different uh, forms, T, S, and P, Let's assume that these are different forms, right? Or just uh, letters or phonemes or something. One for tree, one for firewood, and one for fire. Um, then we, we may use these data and transform them into this uh, uh, lexical matrix. Uh, this table here represents the exact information that we saw uh, in the previous uh, slide. Um, we have the languages in this column here, uh, the forms, and the different senses. We have the three senses, three, five, and fire, right? And then we use uh, one when a form has a meaning, right? and uh, zero when the form does not have the meaning. And in the first uh, case, in the language X, we, our form expresses all these three meanings. All right. So we're talking about here full collectification, and now I'm using again the term by uh, Schaper and uh, her colleagues. And in the, the second language, language uh, Y, the form uh, E expresses only three, as you may see from one, uh, firewood and fire are expressed uh, uh, from E uh, through do and so on. Right? And you see also the full differentiation pattern in the language X with the stress here, uh, where each uh, form expresses just one uh, meaning. Um, now, uh, Let's now try to uh, move further and try to uh, reach uh, the conclusion what one can do with semantic maps. Uh, here we saw that uh, do co-expresses uh, fire within fire, fair enough. Uh, and there was no edge here. We add the edge, why? Because what does the semantic map approach uh, tell us? That if two meanings are expressed by one language form in at least one language, the corresponding meaning should be connected. Ah, co-expresses uh, tree and firewood. We add an edge. Why? Because if two meanings are expressed by one language form in at least one language, the corresponding meaning should be connected. And then we are also uh, encircle all these three meanings because ah co-expresses all three meanings. Okay? And here we can uh, use um, a more complex uh, version of the semantic map connectivity hypothesis, the one that we saw before, which uh, uh, reads as follows. Any relevant language specific and construction specific category should map onto a connected region in conceptual space. So uh, the relevant language specific and construction specific category here is the form of, and this form maps onto a tree, firewood, and fire, and he, all these three uh, meanings appear connected. And that's the important thing. There is nothing uh, intervening. I can walk from tree to fire without interruption. And the full differentiation uh, pattern can be seen here with uh, the two expressing uh, tree, so expressing firewood, and so expressing fire. Um, now, 
given this uh, data set, um, yeah, what we infer is that we, we should not add an edge between tree and uh, fire. Okay. Uh, why is that? Uh, because remember, uh, when we were, we were discussing the semantic uh, map connectivity hypothesis, the uh, not the uh, complex version, we said that if a form, a form R, for example, co-expresses two meanings, a tree and fire, right? these two meanings should appear connected, right? So we should add an edge connecting tree with fire. But we don't do uh, uh, that because um, firewood, when we uh, find uh, firewood, okay, um, or let me put it that way, um, when we have here a uh, tree and fire, okay, uh, we, always, uh, we always have uh, firewood, right? That's the, 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 uh, the thing. If you check here for tree and fire, nothing here, okay, only in this case here. Uh, and um, uh, so we can remove this edge and still retain the connectivity uh, principle here. Um, so we, what, what do we mean by that? Again, I'll repeat that, that we can walk from tree uh, to uh, fire without an, uh, an interruption. Now, this figure is intended to represent the minimum number of edges required to maintain semantic connectivity. So we deleted this edge, right? And um, still our map is valid. And what do we mean by valid? That it describes accurately uh, the patterns, the co-expression, the connectivity patterns we see in the languages that we had in our data set. Um, so uh, this uh, follows the economy principle uh, which again has to do with uh, re re retaining the minimum number of edges, and which goes as follows. Two meanings are connected by an edge, if and only if they are not already part of a subgraph of meanings expressed by a single polysemic item in a given language of the, of the sample. And so, um, so our two meanings are tree and fire. We did not connect them because um, uh, these two meanings are already part of the subgraph of meanings expressed by A, the form A, as we saw uh, before. Now, so the, the new part uh, of uh, uh, today's talk. So how to construct a semantic map automatically. Um, let's start uh, first by saying that we focus on connectivity maps, not proximity maps. So we focus on maps that have edges. And remember that in proximity maps, uh, the proximity of meanings was the important notation and proximity uh, reflects uh, uh, semantic association. Okay, that, but also the fact that uh, two meanings appear very co-appear uh, very frequently in the language of the world. So if, for, for example, we have specific known and specific unknown very closely in our map, now I'm talking about the proximity map, this will be indicative of the fact that, that uh, um, there, are, there are a lot of markers in the language of the world co-expressing these two functions, specific known and specific unknown. But now here we focus on connectivity maps. And what was the problem? Um, as was um, already uh, as was already uh, identified in the relevant literature, um, it was practically possible to handle large scale post linguistic data sets manually. First of all, so uh, you can construct manually um, connectivity maps if you have like uh, ten languages, twelve languages, even forty languages, as was the case with a Haskell maps a data set on indefinite pronouns. But what happens when you have to consider 100 languages? Then uh, it's almost impossible to uh, draw them um, manually. So that's the first uh, problem. And uh, the most uh, serious problem about now, uh, the possibility of drawing them uh, automatically is that semantic maps are not mathematically uh, aware. 
at least not mathematically well defined or computationally tractable, make it impossible to use with large and highly variable cross linguistic data sets. Um, this was the criticism that Croft and Poole uh, put forward against uh, these connectivity uh, maps. So it, it, it was not very easy, it was very hard from a computational point of view to draw to um, uh, draw them automatically. And uh, uh, the, the larger your data set, then the harder the problem uh, would be. Uh, and given the fact that ideally, as um, mentioned by Naro and Ito, it should be possible to generate semantic maps automatically on the basis of a given set, set of data. And the fact that we didn't have the chance to do that uh, up until a certain point was a problem. So uh, let's now see uh, the way out of this problem. So inferring semantic maps. Uh, Regier, Heterpal, and Majid showed that the semantic map inference problem is formally identical to another problem that superficially appears unrelated. What's that, that problem? Inferring a social network from outbreaks of disease in a population. So that's now from a paper published in 2013 in linguistic typology. So what's the idea? Let's consider a group of uh, social agents represented by the nodes of a potential graph. So these are uh, nodes. We know graph uh, now, right? So these are nodes, no edges. And uh, we uh, call them social agents. These are real uh, persons, right? Now, if one observes the same disease for five of these agents, you know, I color them with orange, we call them uh, technically a constraint on the nodes of the graph. So what's a constraint? So there is uh, uh, something that all these agents share, right? So uh, for example, if we transfer this to uh, the meaning form relation, uh, one form has all these five meanings. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if one observes the same disease for five of these agents, one can postulate that um, all these agents met so that all the nodes of the graph are connected, uh, right? So we can say okay, uh, this agent, this person has this disease, right? Also these, and these two agents met at some point, and that's why they are both sick from the same disease. They, they both suffer from the same disease. Same with this guy here. And then we can say that uh, this guy here met with this guy here, but we can also say that this guy here met with this other guy here, and so on. Um, so in the end, we would have uh, 10 edges. So if you count all these edges, this will amount to 10 between the five nodes. But this is neither a very likely nor a very economic explanation, right? Why? Because uh, uh, well, this guy might, uh, met, uh, uh, might have met this one, uh, but uh, uh, this one might not have met this one, mm -hmm. right? But uh, so, um, and uh, or this one. But the fact that this here, this person here met with this person here uh, will suffice to uh, for that person to suffer from uh, the same uh, uh, disease if this two guy is met. So uh, bottom line, this guy here does not have to meet with this guy here, right? The goal would be to have all the social agents, all these persons here, connected with as few edges as possible. Edges are connected lines. Now, such a network inference problem, so this is how we call this, uh, looks intuitively simple, but is computationally hard to solve. Anglin and colleagues concluded in a 2010 paper that the problem is indeed computationally intractable, so very difficult to be solved, um, but proposed an algorithm that approximates the optimal solution nearly as well as is theoretically possible. Now, how does it translate to semantic maps? Now, we said that nodes are meanings, so we have meaning one, meaning B, meaning C, and meaning G. 
right? So nodes are meanings. And once you have a set of constraints here, and which are the linguistic patterns of focal expressions. So now here in this uh, figure, um, we have uh, all the dashed lines represent uh, constraints, sets of constraints. So this one here is a constraint. This one here as well is a constraint that encompasses uh, these three nodes. And this here is also a constraint. And one connects the nodes economically based on these constraints. So let's try to make this uh, simple. We have our lexical matrix. So this is an abstract four meaning matrix with our four meanings and four, five forms. And uh, you see that the form one has a meaning A and meaning B, form two meaning B and meaning C, and so on. Now, the goal is to find the minimum number of edges between the nodes such that each pattern of co-expression will pick out a connected region of the graph, which is a way to rephrase the joint connectivity hypothesis and economy principle. So uh, the goal is here to connect all these nodes in a, an economic way. And an uneconomic way would be to connect uh, B to A, B to D, uh, D to A, D to C, C to A, and so on. Okay, so the goal is to find the minimum number of edges between the nodes such that, that each pattern of expression will pick out a connected region of the graph. What does this mean? It means that we need to find the perfect diagrammatic represent representation, so the perfect number of edges that will describe accurately the variation we see in our data. Um, now, how does this work? How does this algorithm work? Because we remember what we are talking about automatic plotting. The algorithm considers the utility scores of the edges, that is the number of constraints that the edges satisfy when they are added to the graph. So that's a bit difficult, but we'll try to explain that. So what's the here utility score, um, for example. Now, um, take this uh, edge here, these two nodes, and we have an edge here. And um, uh, let's uh, remove this edge. Okay, so we have only these uh, two nodes. And we add the edge now. So now we have the edge. And the question is, what's the number of constraints that uh, uh, this edge that we added satisfies when we added this to the graph? So uh, I added this edge. Remember that these are constraints. So the, the dust lines here represent uh, the constraints. So this is a constraint, this is a con another constraint, and this is another constraint. So by adding this edge, what's the number of constraints that I satisfy? The question, the answer is two, right? Because um, remember that this is a constraint and this is another constraint. By adding this edge here, and uh, I satisfy this constraint one and that constraint as well, two. So the utility score of this particular edge will be two. So the higher the number of the utility score, the more important um, the edge is for um, the, the graph, which means that this edge should be there. If the utility score of an edge is very low, then the chances are that we might uh, delete this edge. So let's see how do we do that. And um, now we have in the form one, meaning A and meaning B, right? And um, form three, again, meaning A and B, and form four, meaning A and meaning B. So the utility score of uh, uh, this co-expression pattern is three, uh, because it satisfies three, uh, three, uh, constraints. One, two, and three. Uh, now, what about the pattern B and C? We see that in form two and form five. This means that the utility score is two. Uh, two is also the utility score for the pair B, D. 
Why? Okay. Because B and D are found in two forms, the form three and form five. Uh, now, as for uh, the mean pair C, D, then the utility score is one because it is found only in one uh, form. Yes. So you, you, uh, there's a technical term which is constraint, mm -hmm. which would you say it's synonymous to property, to sharing a property, like uh, three people who are, have the same sickness. So it's mm -hmm. it, yes. three nodes which share the same property. And mm -hmm. Can you say they share the same constraint? Is that how you uh, Yes. And uh, no, so that's part of the, uh, the answer. So uh, um, what you said describes a hypergraph. Okay, I, I didn't mention that here. Okay. So it's a, because the the, uh, the nodes without adding uh, the edges, right? Uh, when you have like, uh, let me go back. So uh, for example, uh, let's take this constraint here, uh, the one that encompasses three nodes, one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. So without adding uh, the edges, that's a, a hypergraph. Mm -hmm. And um, here, by adding the edge, you uh, uh, you say that it, um, it's uh, you, you set a certain constraint that um, there is a reason why I connect this one and this one and not that one with that one here. All right? So the hypergraph does not tell you that. The constraint does tell you that. Can, yes. Can you give an example of a constraint? Like if you were talking about disease, so does that mean that if you go back to your to your the specific slide? Hey, this one, yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, does that mean that the, the, the two guys are up and on the right have a small parts, and then uh, the three guys on the on the top have also uh, the flu, and then the two lower guys have uh, some other disease? Exactly. So yes. different kind of disease, so yeah. different yeah. kind of reason to be connected. Yeah, so uh, these guys here have uh, one certain disease, disease mm -hmm. A, but also have uh, this, uh, disease B, mm -hmm. okay? I, I, how do we know that? Because if this represents diseases, right? Because they are also included in this constraint as well. Okay, uh, okay. yeah. And so if you transmit it to language, mm -hmm. uh, how would that translate? Because the meanings are not totally, the, the disease I mentioned are totally mm -hmm. disconnected. But the meanings are not in the example we had with firewood and mm -hmm. all that. So how would that graph represent linguistic constraints? Okay, so we, like here, right? So like here. Um, may I show you this and then we'll let, let, all right, oh yeah. Um, because this is part of the answer. Um, okay, so we take now the utility scores and we draw the edges based on uh, the number of the utility score. So the higher the number, we, we start with this. So we start with uh, the constraint. So th this is the pair now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, a, B, Y, because the, 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 this has the highest utility score, right? Okay. Then we move on with uh, those pairs that have the utility score too. So B and D and B and C. And then we don't, uh, here we stop. Why? Uh, at this point, the algorithm stops because the graph is minimally connected and accounts for all the co-expression patterns of the table. Okay. And uh, how do we know that? I mean, if we go back to the data, we see why and um, shall I connect A and D? And uh, here, A and D does not appear here. And A and D does not appear here. A and D does appear here uh, in form uh, uh, three. Okay, um, but again, it appears all, all, uh, already in the context of B. So why is this helpful? Why? Because I can walk from uh, D to A without an interruption. Right? If B was not there. Uh, I should have had a line here because I, I couldn't this it couldn't be possible to walk from here pass through the mean B and then arrive at a since we have mean B here in, in, in form three we can do that that's why we are able to delete this edge or not to include it 
same with um, it's a way to be more economical. Yes, right? yes, yes, because uh, um, this will lead to an, a counterintuitive uh, result that we saw with the uh, the patients that uh, everyone should have met with each other because they had the share they have the same disease. Um. Okay. Uh. So here now, um. We have like uh, maybe uh, no um in uh, in this uh, sorry the, the yeah yeah I don't know if I can do that. ah I can I can do that yeah sorry yeah yeah um 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 D C and B okay D C and B so uh, just these uh, three connections account for all the cases yes and that's what we mean by a minimally connected a uh, graph. And um, it might not be the perfect uh, a, a graph, but describes accurately the variation we see in uh, in the data. Okay. Um, uh, can we go back to your question now? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because uh, the, the first example of a disease was that your guys all have the same disease, but your graph looked like they might have different diseases and just cumulate them. So we're not absolutely sure. This is. This is cross linguistics, not inside one language. This, this is cross linguistics. This is always this is always cross linguistics. Yeah. And here B, D, and C, B and D and C, okay, should appear uh, again in, in the same constraint, right? Here as well. Um, so there's one form that expresses uh, B, D, and C, right? But there's another form that expresses only B and D. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this uh, in a way uh, a tree firewood. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, what if we change the edges from, for example, uh, A connecting to B and B connecting to C? We are, we are the ground, like D connecting to A, D connecting to B, D connecting mm -hmm. to C, it would be the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, the, uh, let me see DNA, DNA. Uh, uh, we have to see what the utility score of a, a, a and D, right? The utility score is one. So the algorithm starts with the highest utility score. You might be right, but if we uh, delete the edge from uh, uh, this edge here and add it here, this uh, represents the data accurately as well. And that's true, but the, the algorithm does not work in that way. So it starts with the highest right. utility score, and it it makes sense because uh, uh, the A B is uh, a pattern is very frequent. So it starts with, with this one, okay, and this one it might be uh, found only in one language uh, in this data set. So uh, that's a problem to start with this. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, Regier, now back to the language data, um, claimed that the approximations produced by the algorithm um, suggested by Angruin and the colleagues are of high quality, and they tested this algorithm on the cross-linguistic data of Hasselmann and uh, Lemison and colleagues. Uh, so that's the a semantic map of the indefinite pronouns functions published in 1997 uh, in a book um, uh, uh, by Hasselmatt. Um, so uh, I'm gonna show you this uh, example, not the Lemis and Italia uh, data. Uh, just a few uh, examples here uh, for, for the notations that you use here, uh, specific and known. Uh, the, an example that uh, uh, resents this sense is somebody calls you guess who, Specific unknown, somebody called you, but I don't know who. In uh, indirect negation, I don't think that anybody called, non specific, John needs to find someone for the job. So, this is just a sample of examples that um, um, showcase these functions. Um, so, um, Hasselman uh, produced this semantic map using data uh, from 40 uh, languages. And uh, Let's now try to see what uh, did Regier et al. do with his uh, data. They, they tried to reproduce uh, the map, and uh, they used as input a, a lexical metrics as the one that I showed you before, where you have here languages 
in the first column, forms words in the second column, and uh, functions, specific unknown, specific unknown, irrealist, question, conditional, indirect negation, and so on. And um, yes, okay. And one means that the form, for example, etwas in German, uh, has the meaning. So etwas uh, means specific known, specific unknown, irrealist and specific, question, conditional, indirect negation is used in, the, in such context, that is. But Irrigant uh, is not used uh, in specific known uh, function, right? Or a uh, yeah uh, is only used in question, conditional, indirect negation, and so on. And so when they use as input this matrix, they run their algorithm and they produced the, this result, uh, which as you may see, uh, do I have it here? Yes, I have here. Um, so uh, this is the one uh, produced by the algorithm automatically. And this map is, and now uh, this one was produced manually uh, by Hartman. And you see there is a dash? Success story. Yeah. It's a success story, yes, exactly. Um, so there is a dashed line here um, because actually the algorithm did not include an edge between irrealism specific and conditional. And um, Fassbender uh, claimed that he had this uh, edge because uh, he considered more data from the 40 languages that he had in the sample that was published in his uh, 1997 book. Uh, Let's see now why. Um, see, th th these are the patterns uh, from the 40 languages uh, of Hasselman's uh, data set. And uh, numbers correspond to uh, meanings here. Uh, for example, uh, the Serbian Croatian ne here uh, co expresses specific known, specific unknown. Irreal is not specific. This this means the one two three here, yeah. or uh, two three four five. Uh, the Greek ka has a specific non irreal is uh, a specific question and uh, conditional, and uh, and you may see here. You sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the methodology of Hasselman to mm -hmm. to get uh, these results? So. If you use native speakers, questionnaires, like data, focus data, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Please? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the question is, what's uh, the methodology that uh, Hasmut used uh, in producing this map? So uh, uh, did he rely on questionnaires or uh, grammars or something? Uh, if I remember correctly, he relied on uh, grammars and on uh, his uh, personal knowledge of uh, some uh, uh, languages. Uh, but the, the thing is, uh, did Hasselmat include the notion of connectivity, this question of minimal edges and so on, or is it something that researchers started thinking about late, ten, late, uh, ten years later? It was implied yeah. uh, in his approach. So in a way, it ref this is a minimally uh, constructed uh, graph. Uh, Both things are from Hasselmat, right? Both the lists and the yes, and the, the these list. are from Hasselmat now. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, now, what you see here uh, at the bottom is from uh, Regier and okay. colleagues. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with this slight difference, you see with the dust line. I'm okay. going to explain this. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so researchers tried to disprove this now to find different patterns, but they, they didn't manage to <laughs> do so. Um, uh, so this is a, a pretty stable. Uh, map. Uh, by the way, Hasmut in his 2003 paper uh, claimed that using a sample of uh, 12 languages that are early and genetically unrelated would suffice in order to have a stable map, uh, which is not very accurate, but just to give you a, a picture, uh, I mean, he used 40 languages, so uh, that's why his map is uh, pretty uh, stable. Uh, now, if you check um, uh, the, the connection between uh, three and five, right? And um, if you might uh, see why the algorithm did not produce, did not add an edge there, uh, because uh, when you have three and five, you always have four as well. Three, five, four, right? Three, five, four, three, five, four, three, five, four. Same, I mean, and vice versa, right? 
Uh, so you could uh, delete this one or that one, but we have to check for the utility scores. Apparently, um, the utility score of 3.4 was higher. That's why the algorithm retained the 3.4 edge and it deleted this one because the 3.45 utility score was not uh, high. Uh, we will see whether this is the case later because I have a list of the utility scores from uh, this map. Uh, now, so how one can do it on their own? How one can automatically plot uh, semantic maps? Um, first of all, we have to use the algorithm provided by uh, Regier and uh, colleagues to, to automatically infer a graph. Um, uh, a year ago or so, uh, the, the algorithm was uh, uh, in, on his website, on the regular uh, website, but now it, it's not there anymore. So you have to contact uh, him in order to um, get uh, the algorithm, or you might contact me, but I won't give you the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he also gives uh, some uh, samples on how to structure your data. So if uh, this is just a snapshot, it's not I'm gonna uh, click on something uh, as a screenshot. Uh, okay. The input mm -hmm. file is a set of ones and zeros, is a matrix file. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll show you exactly how mm -hmm. one should uh, structure the data. Uh, so you may use the algorithm provided by regular and the colleagues. And if you want to uh, add weight to edges, you might uh, take our algorithm that can be found uh, on this web page here. So by adding weights, you take into account the frequency, the frequency with which uh, you find uh, a good expression pattern in the language of the world. And as for the data set uh, for uh, the map of indefinite pronouns, this is given by Hasmat. If you uh, check this uh, link here, you will be redirected to the uh, data set. So you will download it. And now, how I should prepare the material. Um, so you should have another column the language, uh, another column the word, then uh, the label of the sense, okay? and then you may add your an abbreviation, maybe if you're, uh, you have a, a large uh, list of meanings and then you might feel that there will be, uh, your graph will be too packed with uh, meanings, you might uh, use abbreviations. So this is how you want to structure the data, right? With one and zeros, one, the form has the meaning, zero does not have uh, the meaning. Um, one needs to, in order to do so, uh, to one needs to install Python. Um, uh, I, I also use Anaconda, which is a free and open source distribution of the Python and our programming languages for scientific uh, computing. Uh, so this is the environment I'm using and this is what I will use today. And uh, for visualizing the result, um, you may use uh, the program called Gethi, uh, which is the, an open graph visualization platform. Okay. And uh, yeah, sorry. if you have downloaded Anaconda, uh, this is the environment you get. And then you, you have like a, a list of uh, tools that one can use. I will use uh, Jupyter here. You shall click on the launch here. Um, then uh, this uh, uh, connects to your browser, okay? And you get this environment here. And uh, you, uh, the, the, the point here is that you should find is to create a folder where you shall put your data set and the Python script in there. And you should uh, be able to locate this folder. Right? So I located this uh, on my desktop, right? As I say here, everything needs to be in the same folder, the Excel file and the Python script. The Excel file with uh, the data set and the Python script provided by regular colleagues. Um, then you run Anaconda as I showed you before, you run a Jupyter Notebook and you locate the folder where the files are. And then you 
uh, I have included screenshots, but I, I can repeat this process without the screenshots uh, in a few minutes if you like, because I think it's more interactive, it's uh, better, but uh, I'll show you the first. Um, then you go to your folder, you're trying to find your um, Python script, uh, you right click, you, ed you click edit with idle here. Uh, all right. And then you have your uh, code open. You copy the code and paste it to the Jupyter notebook environment and you click run. And you get um, the, the, the script runs, the algorithm runs, and you get uh, uh, you know some information, the result, which is the output. And you, you get you see here that you took this course of uh, the meaning pairs, right? So uh, question conditional, the utility score is 64. Question indirect negation is 49, which means here that uh, con question conditional, this expression, connectification pattern um, is attested in 64 languages. Right? Uh, question indirect negation 49, 46. So let's uh, now uh, See what were were the defenses before? Let me check. Sorry for that. Three, four, irrealis, and non-specific non conditional. Non-specific conditional. Uh, non uh, irrealis, non specific. Can you see it? Irrealis, non specific. Um, with specific number of uh, Yes, um, yeah. You don't get the uh, utility score there because there is no edge. Okay. Uh, so we have the edge here, um, the, the three, four, Irrealis question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Irrealis, okay, which is 46. So, and we uh, uh, assume that this utility score is uh, higher than the three five edge, uh, which is actually uh, the case. And then, uh, what the algorithm also gives you as an output is this very preliminary graph, which is very ugly, does not tell you anything. And this is this now creates also a GML file, um, which you then use uh, to. Uh, for for Gephi, right? Uh, we need to uh, use this Gmail file in Gephi in order to have our result visualized in a proper way, in the appropriate way. So you run Gephi, you open the file, uh, you uh, the Gmail file. There is a drop down menu. You choose undirected graph, not directed graph. Uh, what's the difference? Directed graph includes arrows. No directionality here. Undirected does not include arrows. Mix has both, right? but uh, uh, our graph is undirected because there is no uh, directionality here, which is something different in graph theory in any case. And that's now, if you uh, import this GML file uh, into Jeffy, into Jeffy, so this is the, the result you take. But there are several things that you can do to make it um, more beautiful. So first of all, you should show the node labels. So in this case, um, I have included the um, abbreviations. So you see the abbreviations, all right? And then we need uh, to run another algorithm. We need to choose a layout. Here we chose Force Atlas 2, which is uh, normally used. Um, remember that we are trying to make our graph more beautiful. And so, and if we apply this, if we run this algorithm, uh, this is the result we take. So that's a, a much better now looking uh, graph with the meanings and so on. You might manipulate the scale in here uh, if your graph is too small or too large. Right? So you might adjust the scaling. I have adjusted uh, to 2000 here, as you may see. Uh, then, um, 
oh, we might take advantage of several tools that are given uh, with uh, Gephi. Uh, for example, we might use a community detection algorithm, which do what? Um, community detection algorithms uh, try to uh, identify groups of um, meanings of or whatever you have here, uh, uh, given the data that you have imported, right? Given your data set, what are the communities that can be inferred? So we run uh, statistics here. Uh, we run here modularity is the analysis that we picked for the community detection. And we, we go here to click on partition. We choose the attribute, which is the modularity class. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, um, this is now too fast, but uh, I have included all sc screenshots. And then I will give you the slides and you can uh, uh, play with all these and try to produce your own maps, all right? So you click on modularity class and then you get, uh, you, you click on apply here and you get different colors, which are not very visible, I think. Uh, uh, there is a, a purple and a, 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 an orange and green. And so you get three uh, communities, three clusters, three groupings. Okay? And, so, and then the uh, question whether these communities make sense is, I mean, depends on you. I mean, if they make sense, you might make, make want to make a story out of it, right? So, but uh, these communities were detected automatically. Okay. And then you take a, a screenshot here. Uh, there's something missing from my picture um, uh, here. Anyway, I don't know why. Uh, so there is a button that you click uh, at the bottom where, where you can uh, take a screenshot and save the graph. You cannot see it uh, here mm -hmm. for some reason. Um, now, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, 25 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, so it will be half. Um, so this means that I can go back and show you again how one can do that. All right, so as for automatic uh, plotting uh, of weighted maps, Nothing new here. What we uh, add is the information about the frequency of the station. So weighted semantic maps are much more informative than regular semantic maps because they visually provide information about the frequency of policing patterns. And uh, in, uh, in our 2021 paper, uh, we used a modified version of the algorithm provided by Radier and Tyler uh, in order to be able to produce such, construct such a weighted semantic map. What's the principle? For each edge that has been added between two meanings of the map by the algorithm, check in the lexical matrix in the data set, how many times this specific policing pattern is attested and increase the weight of the edge accordingly. And so if uh, you find this police, one policing pattern only one uh, time, so you do nothing. So that's, if you find it 10 times, then you increase the edge. 50 times, you increase the edge proportionally. Um, and now let's compare uh, the result here. That's the, alg the uh, map uh, constructed uh, by regular Italy on the basis of Hasmer's data. That's again the automatically plotted map. And that's uh, our map, uh, which is uh, uh, produced using uh, this adjusted, this modified version of uh, the algorithm, which takes into account frequency of the station. So the same thing, but now you're given the information uh, that question condition, for example, um, uh, this is a much more frequent co-expression qualification pattern. Uh, in the language of the world than traditional comparative, all right? So in a way you include the utility scores uh, on the map. And you might just add the, uh, the numbers, right? Uh, on an unweighted map. Here. Just remind the, the audience that yeah. we're talking about things like any in English, right? Yes, somebody, so somebody. Like question and conditional are expressed in the same way. It's question is a yes. shortcut for an indefinite marker used in questions and indefinite. Exactly, yes, or some. Uh, some, some or, or no, 
no one, nobody. No is uh, one marker for no one and nobody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so both are produced automatically. Uh, this one is uh, this one includes uh, the frequency of the station. And yeah, again, if we apply the modularity analysis, so the community detection algorithm, uh, you get uh, this nice result here. Uh, uh, the algorithm groups together in reality, no specific, specific unknown, specific known, uh, hence the orange color. Uh, the algorithm grouped together conditional question, and it also grouped together free choice, comparative, indirect negation, and direct negation. So we have three communities here, uh, indicated by three different colors, orange, uh, uh, green, and purple. And you may see that here are some colors that are in between green and orange, all right? And this, this show that just uh, the connection, okay? Uh, these are not really grouped, uh, so that, that, that's why we have a, a color which is between orange and uh, uh, green here, and a color which is between purple and uh, green here. Okay. Yeah. I have a naive question. Mm -hmm. So this algorithm ended up uh, ended up bringing together three orange dots as mm -hmm. being one cluster. Is that the word? The cluster. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we can see that the, the strength of the link or the width or whatever, you know, uh, between erase non specific and specific unknown is much weaker. So mm -hmm. intuitively, I would have thought that maybe the, the, the orange dot in the middle would have been clustered with the green one because mm -hmm. they, they have stronger yeah. ties. Yeah. Um, apparently, uh, uh, the, the algorithm takes into account a, a wider context. So um, it sees that these three nodes uh, share some features. Maybe they are found altogether in more languages or something like that. Okay. Um, same with all these four languages, okay? It does not work in a pairways uh, function. It works here, so conditional question, okay? You only see a pair, but apparently it sees uh, more commonalities in this group for some reason. I mean, that's why it's more exploratory, right? It just shows you, imagine that this is helpful when you have uh, too much data and uh, with like uh, thousands of uh, nodes and edges, and then you don't know how, where to start, right? Yeah. And then the, uh, the clusterings, the different clusters might give you an idea of your of where to start. Right. Uh, another question. So here it detected three communities. Mm -hmm. It could have detected four or five. Is um, it you? Is it like a cursor no. that you choose? Or no, no. It, this is all, also automatically. Uh, it, it, uh, I didn't set a threshold. Please do find only two communities. I don't know. I mean, it might be possible. It's not possible in Gephi. Uh -huh. So it uh, identifies those communities that exist. In, in the data. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are different commu community What if detection. I don't believe the algorithm? Uh, of course. I mean, because yeah. I believe that the, yeah. the, the last orange one and the green one form a community. But, that, that, but that's a machine. I mean, How can uh, I tell the machine? That's, that's your that's wrong. That's your stance, right? Mm -hmm. The stance you should take. I mean, you don't believe the machines. Well, don't believe blindly the machines. <laughs> Yes, we have to understand. Yeah, I mean, um, all these I I would say that are more exploratory, right? They uh, give you an idea of where to start. They like like blinking. They look at me. I mean, I, there might be something interesting there. So don't hide some uh, hidden patterns or something. And uh, that will be it, actually. Um, and I know that was more technical. And uh, so I, I would be happy if there are any questions. If you wanted to go back and show you in real time how one can uh, do that. If there's no, we'll see if there are questions, but if you want to do a little bit of a demonstration. Yeah, sure. Or from Zoom, maybe questions. Yeah, yeah, we have enough time. We have like 30 minutes. Uh, any question on yeah. this graph? Mm -hmm. um, you have a line between conditional and comparative, which is the same line. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this well, the program has put this line in because there is at least one language that has comparative and conditional together that does not have 
question and indirect negation with them. Otherwise, it could be forbidden to have this line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because of the economic principle. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And a connectivication network here, that's a thing, would include uh, an edge between specific known and irreal is not specific, specific known and irreal is not specific, uh, uh, irreal is not specific and comparative, comparative and question. As soon as there, there is, um, let me go back to the data afterwards. Okay, so that's better. Um, so let's see, uh, you see five and six are not connected directly, right? But you see that authentic is okay? six, uh, five, six. So the connectification network approach will tell you that you should connect five and six because yes, that's the thing. Uh, okay, fair enough. So it, it, when you say this, it's sort of a critique of the, of the collectification approach to say, I mean, I mean, the collectification approach would include links between all of them, or do a hypergraph and forget to and and omit to uh, uh, calculate the minimal connectivity. Right. I, I would say that collectification networks are um, more uh, useful if you consider uh, weights, so the frequency of the station. If you don't consider weights, I mean there are. Uh, useless. That, that's uh, right. so. Uh, if you, uh, I, I would need if you, if I have a connection between five and six, at least I would need to know how frequent uh, is this pattern in the language of the world. Uh, because uh, the classification network approach, uh, I, uh, this is again a reminder, mm -hmm. and does what networks uh, do, and uh, they work in pairwise fashion, and that's it. If they want to include more than two nodes, um, then you consider hypergraphs. So you would say that in this three, four, five, six, I would uh, encircle uh, all these four uh, meanings, uh, uh, claiming that there is at least one language that expresses all these four meanings. But imagine that what your map would look like if you have to do so with all these 40 languages. And then this is to pack. Uh, one approach would be like to have a general classification uh, uh, network, and then a, a separate uh, classification network with uh, the language specific network, uh, which is also useful for the semantic map approach. You can you cannot uh, here you cannot have the language specific uh, patterns visualized very easily, right? You need to. Uh, have your general, uh, let's call it a universal map. And then um, if I want to visualize the German data, I will use only the German ETVAS here, or maybe also the German here because I want to be, uh, or and the German no as well. And then- You would use a hypergraph. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Okay. So the hypergraph approach can be used in both semantic maps and classification networks. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, so there's a question mm -hmm. in the chat by Maria Carali, mm -hmm. uh, who's asking, was Python, I, th I think the answer was negative for Python, but maybe other two, uh, were some of the tools you showed created specifically for semantic maps? And so, and, and if so, um, so in um, uh, Regier and uh, colleagues, used, I mean, adjusted the algorithm that was used in this social network uh, paper. So they adjusted this uh, uh, algorithm that was already there for the question, for this particular question of uh, semantic map inference. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and then we also adjusted regular time uh, algorithm in order to include frequency of attestation. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, they were in, there, there, there are some uh, scripts already there. You adjust them. I mean, uh, if you have a specific question. Could you explain maybe some of people in the audience would like to understand? Uh, I've already asked you this mm -hmm. question last week. Uh, I mean, in private. <laughs> but, uh, uh, why, uh, why would some tools looking at languages 
um, be the same as tools analyzing social networks like I don't know so Facebook or, or, or mm. what, what's the what is common because mm. from a, from a naive person it looks like very two very different uh, mm. questions to ask you know mm. but uh, how would you explain mm. uh, the the logical path going from social network analysis mm. on the one hand uh, talking about people yeah. or about uh, disease and lexicon. Mm. Actually, there, there is a common denominator. We don't start with, from social networks. We start from networks. So uh, social networks use networks, network approach, and uh, connectivity maps, semantic maps, connectivity networks use uh, networks. So um, as soon as you have nodes uh, and edges, uh, you're dealing with networks. And this is common to everyone. Then uh, it's a matter of the question you need to ask uh, to define the relation between the nodes. Uh, what are the nodes? Right? So when we, my, our nodes are meanings, but uh, you, this might be a different one, even in linguistic studies, right? Uh, the nodes might be uh, phonemes, mm. I mean, or whatever you like. And then you might want to- well, can draw a network where the nodes are people, are villages, dialects, phonemes, exactly, whatever. Phonemes, whatever. What, whatever like, but, um, the relation between the nodes might should make uh, uh, some sense, right? Okay, that's uh, the answer. So it's not that we um, draw from a social network or something. And, and these are useful because we take idea, ideas from them, but uh, they use networks. We also use networks. Maybe one, one of the things that are shared by the two worlds, so social network and uh, maybe lexicon and other things, is that one node has multiple memberships, right? So, so one node is connected not just to another node in sort of a, a chain-like pattern, but you, it, these are tools that can handle intersecting patterns or or multiple multiple connections, kind of thing. Yes, definitely, yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if there are no other Questions, we have a bit of time for maybe mm -hmm. a okay. live demonstration. Demonstration. Uh, let me, uh, can I stop sharing for a bit? Yes, yeah, please. Sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me find my tools. All right. Okay. Um, do I have an Anaconda here? All right. I think you're sharing. No worries. Yeah. I, you see, but uh, the others don't okay. see anything. Uh, the algorithm is here. Okay. All right. Okay. Danas is preparing his yeah, yeah. data. Mm, all right. Uh, let me share my screen once again. So um, I will launch uh, Jupiter now. I trust that you can see my screen. Yes, uh, yeah, we can. All right, you see how, um, and now I want to locate the table with the boring name Paris. <laughs> where, <laughs> Or I have included my test. So, okay. So, this is my folder. And remember that it is very important that you, um, you, that you should find, you should locate the folder that you have everything. By everything, I mean the Excel file with a data set. So, this is a husband and uh, the Python script. All right. So, I click on new here, uh, Python 3 here, and then, uh, all right. So, so, this is the environment. Now, I need to um copy and paste um, my uh the algorithm and you know normally this does do not this do not work when you are okay, <laughs> that's yeah. fine to that's do it yeah, yeah yeah okay so let me copy paste that uh, so Jupiter, how would you call it? It's it's a Jupiter. software for yeah. detection community detection. No, 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 no. Just uh, you know, uh, an environment where you can uh, run your algorithms, like uh, run them using Python. Okay. okay, okay, okay. So this means that uh, normally it should work. Yeah, it works. So I just copied, paste, and pasted the um, algorithm, and then you see, you get the different utility scores that I showed you before. 
okay, with pi. Um, and uh, the list of nodes that were included and the boring graph that I showed you before. And then this is the, the algorithm with some patients, okay? Uh, I'm not gonna, uh, I mean, uh, read the whole thing here. I'm not an expert in uh, Python scripts or anything. Uh, this is something I should uh, say. Uh, I'm able to use all these tools to adjust the time Python scripts. I'm not an expert in Python or something. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, I think it's uh, important. This means that uh, anyone can use these tools with uh, a bit of uh, training, all right? Uh, so normally this, uh, I run the algorithm and this should have created this GML file that I would want to use uh, in uh, Gephi, all right? So let me uh, find now my folder with Paris, see? And uh, oops, and here you see there is a GML file, right? Now I will run a uh, Gephi. So I have already opened it. I use uh, a file, open, try to locate that. Or, uh, so this is the GML file. I click the GML file is what, it's like a matrix of ones and zeros? Or no, no, uh, th this, this is what includes your network. Okay, this is, uh, let me go back to the, uh, Oh no, here. Yeah. It's Actually, like it's a graph. It's yeah, a it's a graph. Yes. Yeah. It's a graph. All right, go back to here. And now, graph type. You see the drop down menu here directed, undirected, mixed. And uh, I have the information about the number of nodes, the number of edges. I don't want directed, I want undirected. Okay. All right. Okay, that's not interesting. All right. So this is the initial graph. And now I can play with the GFE in order to have a very uh, beautiful graph. I will add my nodes. So this the line that appears now, is it already the result of some calculation? Yes, okay. yes, yes. And the... Um, Based on the, the hypothesis and things like that? Yes. Okay. So this is the result of the regular Italian algorithm. It, it won't change anything. Uh, it won't change in the edges. There will be no additions in the edges, no change in the arrangements or something. All right. Uh, I need to add the labels on the edges. Mm. Okay. I I clicked on this one. All right. Then I will I have to choose a layout. And uh, you see, I will choose a layout which will uh, tease apart the nodes. Okay. All right. I will choose this force atlas. This is the one I use. I click on run. You see, it's still nothing interesting. Uh, Not nothing. Yes, I, can yes. <laughs> I can read that. <laughs> I, I will manipulate the scaling, so I will adjust the scaling. Okay. Uh, I, I use 2000, I think, uh, here. I cl click on stop, you can see. But I can use uh, 2050 if you need uh, 500, uh, maybe. Ah, that's better, a bit better. Okay. All right, so I stop here. This is what I need, and, and then, um, this, um, this is the map. I can uh, click on uh, here in order to have a snapshot. Okay. And that will be it. But I, as I said, you might want to include uh, some interesting statistics regarding modularity, uh, that is, the groups, the clusters. So I go to statistics you here. The, the edge, edges thicker? Uh, no. No, I can't. No, I can't. Because it's hard in the data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can do this yeah. here and make it more visible. Mm. Uh, I, I will run on, on modularity here. It runs a test. And then you we see that it detected three communities here. Okay, and you see also the, the, the size distribution. What does this mean? When you uh, see the three. Three here, number three. Okay. Number of communities. And the size distribution, let me remember this, okay. And there are um, three, four, yes, and two. So we have three communities. Uh, one group consists of three nodes. One group consists of two nodes. And another group consists of uh, four nodes. So close. So we have this information now, but we need to apply this. We go to partition here, node here partition. We choose the, the attribute. And we choose the modularity class. Modularity class is there because I ran the statistic before. Okay, so I click on modularity class, and then you get all these 
uh, colors here, the three communities, as we expect, because we saw the number four, um, we apply that and you get the, the different colors, which are not very visible. Okay, they are more visible with uh, the, the weights, to be honest. Uh, and that's also, I, I will click on the so for the audience that the orange is on the right. Is that so, yeah, this is yeah, yeah, okay. the orange you see here. Yeah, okay. okay. And then uh, I think I can. Oh, no, I should do that here. Okay. So, this is purple. Mm -hmm. Remove the, the labels for a second. And this is, and this is green. Yeah. Yeah, basically. All right. Yeah. Okay. So then this is purple. Yeah. And it's orange. Okay, and, and so I can do that and I can take a snapshot. And then uh, oh, before doing that, you might want to have a better resolution. So you pick uh, a different number here, all right? So that's another, okay. And then I can save it. Uh, save, as a picture. Yes, a picture yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I would, I would save it here. So for okay. a given set of data, like this was based on a set of data, yeah. you can get one figure, or, yeah. or you could get more depending on how you... No, just to... one figure, one. just one graph, just one map. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the one. Okay. And then you can include that, in a, of course, in a, in a paper. If it's yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will be it. Uh, I don't know if I can find really quickly the algorithm for the weighted map, but anyway, Maybe in order to show you. If you have an example for basically that. Uh, not ready, so I don't have the data ready. Yeah. Next week, yeah. That's the point. Okay. That's from this room. Mm -hmm. uh, where am I? We are at this top. Thank you. Yes. Uh, how can I go back to this one? I will stop sharing because I have no identify. Okay. okay. And so it, it, you you used Aspen Mass data, which were more like grammatical technology. Uh, can we hear you? I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. Let me mute. Let me. Yeah. So I was just uh, saying. Uh, so the, the examples you've you, you've used was has been math grammatical data, um, perhaps because you know it's a famous semantic map, and and which with lots of nodes interconnected, it's not just a triangle or something. So it, in that sense, it's interesting. But the question is, you you would say that lexical data would warrant the same approach, right? Or or or. Are there some cases where you would say, well, in the case of lexicon, it's different from grammar mm -hmm. for such and such reasons? Um, yes. Okay. I, first of all, we yeah, we can apply the same method uh, to lexical data. Uh, definitely, we have uh, done this. Uh, and uh, by the way, in the next seminar, I will show two examples uh, with lexical data, one from a diachrony and one from, uh, and, you know, uh, trying to answer aerial typology questions. Uh, you can hear me, right? And um, so it depends on the size of your, your sample. So you get so, uh, more informative, let's say, maps when you you when your uh, sample uh, is uh, not, it's not that large. Course. Um, and and uh, in, in many cases, also depending on the semantic domain, you might have uh, many, many meanings associated with one lexeme. And, uh, and then that will be a challenge uh, for, the, for this, uh, this approach uh, because you will end up with uh, too many nodes if you uh, have this phenomenon in many languages, in many, with many forms and so on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, with the grammatical data, I think it's easier to find uh, uh, the data from grammars, maybe, if you, if you rely on grammars, of course. Uh, whereas with lexical data, uh, then just yes, you, have, you have, of course, this database, uh, this database is like uh, the clicks data. But if you want to retrieve data on your own, then this is uh, more challenging, I would say. But, but this is a more general problem, not 
uh, specific to semantic maps. Yeah. But uh, in general, to answer your question, I would but say re reassure me that lexical data can be analyzed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's yeah. That would be my answer. Yes. <laughs> Okay, maybe by way of conclusion, could you re remind us or, or tell us what next week will be about? Yes. Uh, third session mm -hmm. next week. The third session, I will present uh, two case studies. Uh, um, one showing how uh, one can use uh, semantic maps to answer uh, historical linguistics uh, questions. So uh, whether we are able to detect some unhidden patterns that would uh, um, help us in, in this uh, mm -hmm. path. And uh, the second case study uh, that will be, uh, oh, I, will use, I, will, I will use data from ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian. This will, will be uh, uh, based on a collaboration I had with Stefan Polis. He's uh, the expert on ancient Egyptian. And uh, the second case study will be on the perception condition domain and uh, on macro uh, aerial patterns and universal patterns uh, in the lexicon uh, with the, the, case, the case study of uh, perception formation domains. Um, again, this is a, 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 a collaboration um, between me and Stefan, but also Eitan Grossman and uh, Dmitry and Kolev. Uh, so this will be our two case studies for next seminar. Okay, thank you. So I hope everyone, yeah, I just have my mic. Uh, uh, I thank uh, Thanasis uh, for his uh, second uh, seminar today, and we hope um, everyone enjoyed it and that we are going to reconvene in one week uh, from now, Thursday, 4 p.m. Thank you very much, Efharistopoli. Thank you, thank you for being here. Have a good one. A bientôt.